Welcome, everybody, to another episode of After the Film, the show where we talk about that new film that just came out and whether or not it's worth your time. Joining me today is a familiar face to some and a terrifying face to others. Uh, That's Mr. Andrew Sale. Some might say both. Depends on... I guess contextually. And the film that we are talking about is Glass Onion, a Knives Out mystery. This is the second in the uh, Knives Out, I think we're guaranteed trilogy, but maybe more, uh, from director and writer Ryan Johnson and featuring uh, Mr. Blanc, played by uh, Daniel Craig. Uh, The first film... uh, was a huge success and big enough uh, that Netflix uh, picked up the rights to the film and the rights to produce. I believe we're guaranteed uh, two more. Uh, We just got Glass Onion, and just this past month, Ryan Johnson said he is working on the script for a third Knives Out film. Yes. Um, Before we jump into the kind of like quick plot summary in those pieces, Andrew, tell me how you felt about Knives Out. The original one. Um, Yes. I thought it was fun. I I wish I had rewatched it prior um, to this conversation. I wish I had watched it again because I think I would, on a second watch, I would pick up on some things. Um, I did not watch it going into this to, to Glass Onion, but I liked it. I liked it a lot. I thought it was fun. I thought it was uh, unique, but that at the same time, like, harkened back to old school whodunit type yes. mystery movies books that genre um so yeah i i liked it i thought it was a a nice homage with some new twists and and uh same i loved the film uh partially because it's a great film but also partially because within the kind of the mystery or at least the mystery whodunit and even on like the mystery heist side of the genre we just don't get a lot of Films, (laughs) films, <laughs> or especially not a lot of very competent films. And so when we do have a good one, uh, it, it really, really stands out. And it kind of has to last us a while because we're not getting yeah. thrown films like Ocean's Eleven, you know, multiple times a year. Or um, what is it? Ocean's 7 Eleven. Um, <laughs> yeah, Logan kidding. Lucky. Logan Lucky. Um, so, so because of that, I think maybe the films stand out even more because of the the kind of felt scarcity of them. But Knives Out was a, a deeply enjoyable film. And the reason it was so enjoyable is because of the cast of characters. I mean, yes, the mystery itself ended up being satisfying, but even if the, the plot had gone nowhere, the individual characters were compelling and satisfying enough uh, and and kind of varied enough that, that, you know, it's interesting enough that I could just sit there and watch them even if they were uh, ultimately doing nothing. And so looking yeah. forward to Glass Onion, even more than the the plot, because if I'm honest, as much as I do love Ryan Johnson, the first film he developed over a much longer time than the second film in terms of the script. So Right, yeah, that, uh, it was like a passion project for him, right? So I wasn't necessarily confident that this mystery would be as satisfying as the first mystery, but that really didn't matter if the cast of characters was good enough, and boy, is there a cast of characters. Let me just go through uh, some of the names. While you're yeah. doing that, can I, can I ask a clarifying question? Sure. It sounds like you are putting this in a in the same category as, as um, Logan Lucky and the Ocean's Eleven kind of franchise. Um but those wouldn't be considered whodunits. Those are heist movies. You're correct. But okay. the the movie, in a similar way, um, it centers around this mystery. And that mystery is not uh, kind of unraveled or shown to the viewer until the very end. So you get to spend sure. the film kind of putting together... Um, what you think ultimately happened. 
Uh, now, that's not always the case. Sometimes in heist movies, we're along for the process, and then we get to see where they fall apart. In the case of a whodunit, uh, we kind of see the, you know, we see the body first, and then we find out how the body got there. Uh, but in the case of something like an Ocean's Eleven, it's kind of a bit of both because there's a huge misdirect in what we're being told and what's actually happening. And so then we still get kind of the big reveal at the end as well. Sure. Um, so I think it, I think I lumped them together because it evokes a similar vibe. Yeah and, yeah, and it kind of like excites the same part of my brain when I'm yeah. watching them. And that's the reason I lumped them together. Although where you know not everything is as it seems, regardless yes. of what's happening. Like the thematically, it might be very different, but yeah. mechanically, you know, okay, something's gonna get twisty. Yeah. Even though this is more of a like murder on the Orient Express or something. Yes. But yeah, as a more direct comparison. Right. Um, okay, so cast of characters in the new film. Uh, I'm I'm just gonna run through the list, and uh, I think I think you know all of the characters from the previews, but it's possible that I say some that you don't know. So, uh, but that said, just just have confidence that you're introduced to all these characters. I'll say within the first few minutes of the film. Uh, of course, Daniel Craig reprising his role as Benoit Blanc. Uh, fun note, real quick. At one point, Ryan Johnson considered having Blanc have a completely different accent for every film with no explanation Ooh. given. <laughs> Which I think That's is unnecessary. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, 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 it's kind of fun to imagine that That's these like, groups that's of like people literal. Just just artistic expression. Like, it's yes. the same character, but a totally different backstory and different, like, uh, I was going to say font, vocal font. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Ed, Edward Norton, who basically plays uh, an Elon Musk. <laughs> it, we'll, we'll talk about it a bit, but the parallels are probably even unintended, unintendedly close. It's very close, uh, but he plays Miles Braun, uh, Janelle Monet, uh, Catherine Hahn, Leslie Odom Jr., Kate Hudson, Dave Bautista, uh, Jessica Henwick. Uh, there's just so many people in this film, and the thing is, there's a lot of awesome cameos in this film too that I'll make sure not to uh, spoil. But yeah, I was um, gonna say there are some characters and some actors who you don't want to tell. Yeah, completely, completely. Um, so great cast of people. Uh, the film uh, takes place uh, on an island, so it, much like the first film took place within the confines of the mansion, this film takes place similarly in the confines of a mansion, but it's a mansion that sits on an island. Um, but outside of... Uh, there is a little bit more external context that gets set up, but once we're on the island, we stay firmly planted on the island. Um, and uh, the film... Yeah, with those eight or ten whatever people. Exactly. Uh, response for the film has been very good, by the way, um, and uh, but it it has done very little at the box office. But in fairness, it only did a one week box office run, and that was just done so it could qualify for uh, you know uh, film festivals that that have that requirement. But outside of that, we're talking about it now because it is dropping on uh, Netflix this weekend, so you'll have the opportunity to watch it. So the plot of the film. Uh, Andrew, as is customary, do you want to do the quick two-minute synopsis? Two-minute synopsis. Uh, a group of people who are uh, un unknowingly connected at the beginning of the film, or at least you don't know why there's a connection with them at the beginning of the film, all receive a package being invited to participate in a murder mystery weekend uh, off of, like, the Amalfi Coast or something. It's some European... Um, island that they are all going to, a secluded island where they're going to uh, experience a very high-end um, murder mystery weekend for Edward Norton's character um, that he does every year. Is it his birthday or something? Or maybe he just does this every year. I can't remember. Um, and when they get there, then um, this, this fun, playful weekend becomes not so fun and playful when an actual murder takes place and they're trying to figure out who it is. Um, and you, as you could suspect going into this movie, every person there has a reason to have wanted this person dead. And, uh, fortunately Daniel Craig, uh, Blanc is there to solve the case. And so, um, lots of antics, uh, kind of take place. This, this movie is almost to me, I think a direct comparison to clue. Um, this sure. felt very, even more than the original Knives Out. Clues. This felt very much life clue. What? 
I, I, I'm, I'm coining the term Clusian. Clusian. Yeah. Clusian. Yes. So, um, so that's what, that's what happens. And it takes the whole movie takes place in this glass onion, a literal glass, uh, like large glass structure that's shaped like an onion. You find out why uh, the name glass onion throughout the movie, but there is this large glass onion, which is essentially this eccentric purchase of this very rich person. And so, uh, thus the name and thus the, uh, the, the mystery. So that's, that's kind of how the movie, that's the movie plot in a nutshell. Okay, so let's break this up this way, um, because this is a mystery film. If we talk about too much, we give away mystery. Yeah, this and is a spoiler-free And especially, review. this portion is, and especially because of how this film is structured, it makes it even more difficult to not give spoilers. Uh, it, it has to do with the pace of the film, when things are revealed, what's revealed, all that type of stuff. It's just, uh, it would be more difficult. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of compartmentalize this into our broad feelings about, uh, we're going to talk about cast. We're going to talk about uh, our broad feelings about the cinematography. And we're going to talk about our broad feelings about, I don't know a C word for the story, um, but the actual story that's being told itself and in the way that's presented to us. So just some broad feelings, and then we're going to give our rating. So after this, and after we roll the music on the episode, we're going to tack on an extra couple minutes of discussion about uh, that, that we'll have some spoilers about more deeply why we're kind of taking the stance we are for our ratings. Because I don't think we can really get into those unless we say some things that are spoilery. Oh, but sure. that's going to be after, after, after. Um, so once the music rolls, if you haven't seen the film, turn off the podcast. If you have seen the film then you may want uh, uh, the deeper explanation that we'll include after. Okay, yeah. so that's the kind of step. So let's do cast characters first. I know my opinion. Andrew, do you want to go first or second? Uh, in terms of who, who the favorite is? No, in terms of your feeling about the cast in this movie. Oh, my feeling, just in general, my feelings sure. about the cast. Um, I thought it was good. Like it, it, was a, it was a very eclectic group of people. And when I first saw it, I thought, okay, he's just, he's cherry picking people for the sake of um, being, well, <laughs> eccentric, right? Like to be that eccentric artist type. And he's seen different movies where he likes these people and he just wanted to bring them in. But as the movie came together, I thought it was very well cast. I thought that the the people that he brought in did, did an extremely good job. Um, there really wasn't a weak spot in the in the cast other than maybe whiskey maybe she was the 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 least um interesting to me whiskey being sure. uh, the girlfriend of dave batista's character um but but in general i think everybody did they they all played their part well there was no like even even daniel craig i don't feel like he stole the show and ran away with it i feel like everyone everyone brought what they needed to bring to make this a true ensemble movie. So I thought the initially I thought the cast performance in this film was worse than the first with the last night's out film. Um, I thought the characters, even though the individual characters were eccentric in turn or, or very varied in terms of like interest, background, etc., I actually thought a lot of the performances and attitudes were pretty flat and similar and i thought a lot of motivations were pretty flat and similar now upon thinking about the film and, and some of the messaging that they're trying to get across these are all people that have seen some level of success um and are dependent on some amount of other people for their continued success and money making and because of that a lot of them tend to be carrying someone else's message or tend to be a polished version or a fake internet version of a person. And so there's, there's, I don't think on reflection that they're meant to necessarily have a ton of human depth because so much of, of, you know, if we think about the, this Island we're on and this, this experience that's constructed, uh, it, it's a facade, and I think we see the facades more than we see the characters. And that initially harmed my feeling. But now seeing the movie more holistically, I th 
it makes sense as a choice for the film that we are going to participate with facades for the majority of the film. Yeah, I would I would characterize that maybe more simply as they were playing caricatures of archetypes. Yeah, like that's that's what it that's what it ended up being for me. Uh, now they each they each brought a little personality to that and a little twerk, uh, you know, twerk a little. <laughs> <laughs> they tweaked the archetype a little bit to fit to make a like a a profile um, characterization of somebody, but in general, I would say you're dealing with archetypes of people so that you could almost put yourself or see people, you know, in these different roles. But on peeling back the first couple layers, whoa, fairly sh seemingly shallow people. And you'll have to wait till you get to the end of the film to find out if there's any depth to any of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, now that said, I, I think Daniel Craig's performance as Blanc was better this film than the last film. So yes. even though I think the cast was maybe a little bit less human, I felt like Daniel Craig was better. He felt so fully like in stride for the entire film. And I think the other person that was incredibly strong uh, was um, Edward Norton's character of Miles. I, I thought he was my kind of second favorite performance. Other than The Incredible Hulk, I can't think of an experience with Edward Norton where I haven't been absolutely just enthralled with his yeah. performance. He, he always plays characters that I'm like, I wish I could be like that. Even if he's a, even if he's perceived as like not being the best character, even if he's like the, the, uh, the anti-hero or even the, the, the antagonist in a film, I still am like, oh, but he has so much charisma. <laughs> like, and so I want, much, I want that. In so much of his performance in the film had to be, was everything is, easy on the surface yeah nothing can penetrate this skin but you had to feel there's something underneath all the time and he absolutely delivers that performance he is he is uh what i would refer to as a a duck in water right like the water is running off of his back so he doesn't look wet at all but beneath the surface his feet are just kicking and you know the feet are below they're kicking and you don't know what's happening but you know something is happening at some point He's going to get wet. <laughs> like, so, something's yeah, going to happen. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. C beautiful, calm on the surface, uh, just fighting with everything underneath. Yes. Um, okay. So, for the actual um, the cinema, because I do think this film felt a bit different than the last film. Yeah. Um, in some ways, this film is grander scale. Yeah. There are, there are like more special effects in this film. I mean, we're we're dealing with um you're dealing with an island versus an estate yeah and, and we're dealing with a lot of like one-off really unique things mm -hmm. so from that standpoint it's a, it's a lot of things that are uh, a bit made of fancy because we're trying to see how the you know again it'd be like how the richest person in the world lives in their most private sphere that no one gets to see and so because of that we're kind of it's kind of a bit fanciful and made up and guessing and there's things that are a bit future and a bit sci-fi not necessarily a lot but there's some things woven in yeah I, I do think I think the word I know we've said it a couple times in this episode but I think maybe the theme of of this this movie is eccentricity right like everything done unnecessarily like even even the normal characters in the movie do things uh, that are unnecessary things. Um, but just slightly more boisterous, slightly more over the top. Um, and it's because of this setting with this character who has unlimited funds and seemingly, uh, at least on the surface, unlimited imagination and wants to, wants to yeah. express all of that. Now, I saw both films in theaters. Same. I do feel like the first Knives Out somehow felt more movie-ish i don't know how to explain it but like whether it's the the texture of the film or the <laughs> whatever it is it could just be the fact that it's set in a uh an old mansion and it's it's darker and what yeah. <laughs> you know what it, more worn down whatever it is but something about the first film in this in the cinematography 
felt more evocative of these older mysteries. Whereas in this film, I don't know that I felt that as much in the cinematography. And specifically, I, my, the time I actually like really felt it pulled out of me is like one of the last shots in the film. But outside of that, the, the music was certainly doing it. Like the sound was doing mm-hmm. it. The plot is certainly doing it. The script is doing it. But I don't know that I was feeling it in this in the actual like the the cinema bit. The closest version to it, I think, that you're talking about, and I know what you're saying, is at as the movie begins. When the movie begins, you're seeing this intricate, uh, what amounts to like an escape room in a box, like this this like mystery puzzle box that does have those old world feels, those old world vibes, like the original Knives Out had, where you're in this old this old mansion with all this oak and and everything just looks mannerly right and that box is very is very much like that and then as soon as you get to like go on location everything is so bright everything is so pristine everything is so new and and shiny which is a very different feel yeah and it just it felt very clean almost to uh maybe to its detriment a bit. And again, yeah. there there were more elements in the film that had to be done with CGI because of the scale or because of the subject matter or whatever. And that also uh, detracted for me. I, sure. I would love for everything to be practical and I would love for everything to be firmly set in reality. And this was reaching a slightly into the future. Maybe not even as far into the future as the film like her, but it was it was just reaching slightly in the future, and it was enough to to uh, hamper a little bit of the, the my feelings. Like episode two, Attack of the Clones. Everything just a little too polished, a little too shiny. When you grew up in the Star Wars world, where everything was a little bit old and and rusty, we're now like super polished and clean, and it just felt like such a such a stark contrast from what you know that it's it not necessarily off-putting but it is at least jarring and it pulls you out and and i will say and i it's not that the film did this but i think when we're dealing with mystery when we're dealing with solving something then the more that we can work within mechanisms that we firmly understand to be true, the more satisfying the result is. Because if one of the elements that helps you do the solve is based on something that does not exist or is like made up for the context of the film or whatever, then I think that that uh, it, it does make the end result less satisfying to ultimately yeah. get there. So when it's when yeah. everything is firmly set within our physical realm <laughs> and, and, and our understanding of the bounds uh, that exist, I think that's a better experience. Sure. Yeah. You know the rules, and so you can play the game by the rules. Yeah, completely. Which <laughs> is the reason that I, I never liked... Um, now you see me. That's a film that I couldn't enjoy because you can't you can't sell me on the the satisfaction of like sleight of hand and mystery and things like that if it's all fake. Then then, sure. then it you just you know that's uh anyway. Again, we can't talk a lot about the story. So you've you've heard the setup for the film. Beyond that, this would maybe be giving things away. Um but broadly speaking, Andrew, were you satisfied by the story um almost uh i wanted I, I wanted there to be maybe one less twist if that's if that makes sense because this movie is twisty like you know and traditionally in these movies you know that there's um or historically i'll say in these movies there's one big twist this movie has like three or four (laughs) seemingly uh, big twists that that kind of happened. And um, I think maybe it just got a little too twisty. So overall, I think I probably am. um, I like where it went. I like where it landed. I wish there was one, maybe one or two of those things. It just didn't need as many twists. It felt like it kept going and it could have been shortened and been maybe slightly better in my opinion, had we, had we removed one of those twists. I do think too much happened off the island. Um, In in terms of pre, during, post, whatever, just that context that we're fed, the the 
significance of the story that was somewhere else. Um, I think we spent a little bit too much time off the island, even though I we think call it, it flashbackery. Yeah, flash. Yeah, um, that's I don't know that anybody will, but <laughs> that that was the the piece that um, we. I mean, in Knives Out, don't get me wrong. Like we saw this a couple times. Um, uh, it's not like everything happened at the mansion, but the the ninety something percent took place there. Yeah. The the as far as um, the the mystery, the evidence, the that all that all that type of stuff, like the bulk of it, you felt like really just existed in that spot, and a lot of the like whether it was angst or frustration or daddy issues or whatever, like they all like that, that was the centerpiece for all of it. So, so you, when you're sitting there, you're sitting within the mystery the whole time. Correct. Yes. And yeah. in this film, that's just not the case. I mean, the, the Island is just something that happened late in miles life. This is, is not the setting for how all these other relationships developed, existed, where the mystery starts, et cetera. And so, um, I mean, I guess where it starts in terms of a body, but outside of that, mm -hmm. um, it it's just not as big of a piece of it, and it does not have as many like things surrounding you that that point to to the the you know the history of these characters because it's not historical. Now again, there's something to be said for the fact that. It all takes place within a facade, and I think that's an important component of this film. And so, from that standpoint, it's something else you could say feeds into the the theme or the meaning of this film. Um, but I was disappointed how much happened off off the island, and some of those twists you're talking about. I think we could have got rid of them and removed some more of the off island bit, and still had yeah. a very satisfying film. I, I feel the same way. If you had to put a percentage to how much of this movie is off island versus on, or or maybe pre pre-story to like actual story um how what would you what would you lay that percentage out i have a number in my head so if i thought the first film was 90 10 mm -hmm. then this film i would say is like 35 65 i was gonna say 40 60 that was that yeah. would be my guess so that that gives you that gives yeah for people listening that, that gives you yeah. an idea so um but you also may not have a problem with that but it's just uh it's, it's was, there, you know when you think about almost half the movie is flashbackery um yeah. that is a term and i've uh it's everyone's gonna use it uh so you're hearing it here first but uh i think we, that's just something to keep in mind when you're going into this movie if if those kinds of things bug you um like that something happens and then you have to see a flashback for that to make sense to you um if that's a problem for you, you may not like we this got film that as much. A, we, so I'm glad you said that because we also got that a bit more than I liked in this film. I, I never want to be... I don't want to be treated stupid, especially in a film like this. Yeah. Like, if something happens... Because don't get me wrong, Ryan Johnson is, is very good about... If you go back and watch the film, things are going to have been happening the entire time. And right. either you picked up on them or you didn't. Uh, specifically whodunit films and yeah. specifically ryan johnson you can tell so much of the story in a second watch like it, they almost require a second viewing for it to all make sense this one felt like i think you're getting ready to say this a little bit more spoon fed a bit more spoon fed there are more instances of oh we think you might have missed this so let's make sure we really give it to you yeah. And uh, that, yeah, that's, uh, you're stealing, you're you're making Blanc the only detective, but I want to be the detective. Yeah, I'm watching this movie because I want to be the one to solve this mystery. I'm not yeah. watching this movie because I'm rooting on Blanc. I mean, theoretically I am, but like, you watch whodunit movies so that you can figure it out first. That's yeah. the whole fun of these movies. And so if your buddy that you're watching the film with missed that scene and you caught it, you get to rub that in their face later. Yeah, they're you get to say, wait, you didn't know how see? to watch films. Yeah, earlier in the movie, he did this thing, and that let me know that later on, this was this thing. Oh, I or missed that. Or you get to say, yeah, let's let's go pull this up on Netflix, and I'll go to that part and show you, or let's go. Yeah. But if you walk out of the theater and you feel like, 
well, I clearly didn't miss anything because they they went back yeah. and re showed it. They told it to me, me everything that was necessary. <laughs> <laughs> like, then, then that steals that, and it's so it steals my excitement, but it also steals my desire to want to go watch it again. Yeah, so absolutely. Um, with this coming out, like I'm going to watch the film again, inevitably with mm-hmm. like with my wife. I cannot say I, I'm as excited to see this film a second time as I was the first time. So yeah, because you don't you don't have to worry about. And I say worry, like you don't get the fun of looking for things early because they've already spelled them out for you in this movie. They will go back and show you in the movie when you missed, like how you missed it. And, and even if they haven't, that just makes it less fun for a second watch. Even if they haven't, they at least make you feel like they have. Sure. Maybe there's a whole nother subplot that Ryan Johnson has that upon a second <laughs> watching will be like, oh, we missed everything. We missed <laughs> and that, everything. And I would love that. All right, so with that, let's just go and give our ratings because I think we've said as much as we, we can say without spoiling anything. Yeah, it's been very hard to talk this generally for this long about this movie. Yeah, and like I said, after the credits roll on this episode, we will explain our rating with some spoilers. And so if, if you're you watching that, this, there will be a spoiler alert ticker at the bottom, so you'll know <laughs> you're officially in spoiler territory. <laughs> but um, uh, ratings, you know what? I will go ahead and go first. Um when I first walked out of the theater, I was closer to a 7 out of 10, probably. Having, knowing what the film's about, knowing how the pieces tie in, knowing the theme, I I accept it, and I am giving it an 8 out of 10. So I do feel better about it. But I also just want to add on to it. I can recognize that it's a really good film and still feel unsatisfied based on what makes like an amazing film for me. Because an amazing yeah. film for me isn't necessarily an amazing film. <laughs> they, sure. they can be the same thing. They can be different. I think the film's an 8 out of 10 film. But for my personal enjoyment, it's maybe slightly below that. Uh, what's funny is I think I went the other direction. I, I liked it more when I first watched it. I think I came out of the theater as an eight, maybe an eight and a half. Um, and upon thinking back on it now, like reflecting on it, it's been a couple of weeks now since we've seen it and thinking about the, the stuff that we just talked about, the pitfalls uh, of the film, yeah. I think that drops it down to a seven for me. <laughs> so like okay. it's, it's it literally, I think did the exact opposite for me. It's a solid movie. It's very, very fun. Um, I think I had a lot of expectations coming into it from the first Knives Out. And I, I wish that there were some of those things that carried through that would have kept it a little bit higher for me. Um, but if someone tells me an eight, I like I'm 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 pretty much there with them too. Like it's it's very well written, uh, and uh, it, yeah, it's 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 good. It's definitely a, a must watch. Yeah, absolutely. And I I think we for sure agree on that part, which is that if you want a mystery film, if you even more specifically want a who done it, this is one to watch. This, this is, is it, this is you, all you get right now. So. <laughs> watch it <laughs> uh, for sure do not miss this film this film comes out uh this weekend comes out december 23rd so make sure you catch the film when it comes out uh and watch it with a group of people uh it, i think it, it is, is more fun with with people for sure it, it was fun to watch it with it was fun to watch it with becca she hasn't seen the first one and every time someone knew she didn't know anything about it going into it and every time someone new popped up on the screen she said they're in this so <laughs> for no other reason uh, watch it just to see the cameos that we didn't mention because there are some very, very fun cameos, incredible cameos that I will say one specifically about in the spoiler that yeah. almost brought me to tears. So it was very, very fun, very cool. So go there's a movie. solid 10 cameos, I would yeah. say, that yeah. we didn't, we obviously didn't get into. Yes. So it's a must watch film. Watch film when it comes out on Netflix. Uh, I don't think you're. I honestly don't think you're missing anything by not watching it uh, in a theater. But I will say, if you have the opportunity to see it with a little bit better sound system, watch with a little bit better sound system because the sound adds a lot to the tension. It's true. uh, Especially in some key scenes. And so I will say, like, turn up the sound for it, but you're great to watch it in your home. And Ryan Johnson is good with that. He's good with the peripheral stuff, for sure. Like, this was a well-thought-out movie. It was very well-executed. Um, from beginning to end, visually and and auditorily. Um, man, yeah, go see it. 
All right, that's it for this review of Glass Onion and Knives Out Story. For all of our stuff, check out mof1.network. To watch us when we go live on uh, stream, you can watch that live on Twitch or on YouTube at twitch.tv slash mof1podcast or youtube.com slash mof1podcast. Basically, at mof1podcast, wherever social things are sold. And uh, number one podcast. Yes, the, the number one. Because we're um, the number one podcast. Because we're the, not the number one podcast. <laughs> um, in fact, I think we're like 214 in Great Britain, so we're working on it. Um, that's that's okay. pretty close. Make sure uh, you also subscribe, rate, review on all the places you can and where you normally get your content. So Spotify and uh, uh, podcasts and uh, the other things people, I don't know. Stitcher, where, I think st- people still use. Google Play or something. I think that's changed names three times, and I don't even know that that's the current one. I think it's the just the one. Google Media Store or it something. It might just be the Google Media So here, that's the thing, though. Your it's local there. record store. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> you don't even have a local record store, uh, which they talk about in this film, and it's because of Miles. Uh, they don't talk about it in this mm-hmm. film. Um, so that's it. Uh, make sure you do all those things, but otherwise, we will be back the next time there's a movie worth talking about, I'm Patrick. I'm Andrew. Goodbye. Peace out. So let me explain. This is spoilers. The spoilery reason why my review went up, even though my opinion did it. Okay. The idea of the glass onion is that you can peel back as many layers as you want. Mm-hmm. But you can already see through it. And there's nothing there. Oh yeah, that's good. And the thing is, all Shoot. of these, all of this shit is about the fact that it's exactly who you thought did it. It's exactly the most suspicious person. There exactly is one note. Is they come across? They don't have any depth. They're just like the yeah. whole point of the film is that there's fucking no substance to anything. Nothing works. Like, the dock doesn't work. The Like, all the shit his home is broken. Like, it all looks amazing, but it's not functional. Even the thing that he designed, like, he sees it as amazing, but it's going to destroy everything because everything's a facade. It's a glass onion. Peel back all the layers you want to. And you've but there's, seen the center the whole but time. But you've seen the center the whole time, Dang, and it was fucking nothing. And that's the reason it went up for me yeah. because it totally makes sense when you look at it in that lens but it's a bit unsatisfying that the whole result is that's what you thought it was i'm surprised you didn't say when you look at it through that lens given we're talking about looking through glass onions but yeah missed opportunity um so i didn't think about that from that perspective and had you said that earlier i don't know that i would have dropped my rating i think i think it probably would have stayed at like an eight because uh, that's really good. And that's the thing that I felt like it was missing was like this, like over, I said like so many times just now, um, this overarching theme. And I didn't feel the theme. And that is the theme. That's 100% the theme. And and that, that was a piece that was missing to me that I felt, I felt like I had that theme early on. And then as they continued to twist things, it's it started to get degraded for for some yeah. reason. Like it, it got softer and less poignant and less um, articulated, and and, and that was sh- how it needed to be. And it's firmly shown. Uh, Blanc, when he's in the tub, is having trouble playing Among Us because it's too easy, and it pisses him off because it's too easy. It frustrates right. him. Yes. And the reason that this whole thing on the island was confusing for him is because it was too easy. <laughs> it, was it was the he, same. He had thing. it solved. And I loved, I loved, I loved, loved, loved. So, um, Miles Braun, the Edward Norton's character, yeah. is it has this whole weekend planned out, and he wants he he doesn't want Blanc there. Blanc isn't supposed to be there. Yeah. Um, but uh, he has this whole this whole mystery weekend planned out, and and Blanc solves it in the first before the game starts when the game officially begins. When the game officially begins, he already has the answer. <laughs> and he yeah. explains what happens and he goes through the whole thing and he shows the trigger and the mechanism and everything plays out like it's supposed to. And and Braun's just like, well, what the hell, dude? <laughs> like <laughs> He just like, wanted his iPad. I've put 
millions of dollars. Yeah, because he wanted he wanted to win an iPad, and he's he's put millions of dollars and time and energy and effort into building these this like intricate puzzle, and and it was just so easy for Blanc that and right that's, away it was solved. And that's the whole thing. He hasn't because he hires out anyone that does anything for him. He does nothing of his own. He is completely a facade. He, he is right. He takes yeah. credit. He takes credit. He he likes to th- tell people there's more there. Yeah. All these people around him think there's more there. There's nothing else there. The, everyone holds on to him because of what he can do for them. Because he they believe that there is more that he has to offer. And at the end of the day, he has nothing to offer yeah. other than his money. And his money only goes so far as we find out in this, right? It doesn't, it doesn't buy loyalty. Ultimately, it doesn't buy happiness. Ultimately, it doesn't even buy success. Ultimately in this, in this whole thing, everything, he is his own worst enemy. And at the end of the day, his contraption, his contraption that he builds to um, be a fail safe doesn't work through the course of the whole movie, right? Like it, he, it doesn't work. Um, and so you, you mentioned the Among Us scene, and that was one of the scenes that brought me to tears. And that was, he was sitting in the bathtub in this, like, New Orleans, he's from New Orleans, right? Um, like, New Orleans old that's school. What, like, that's what his uh, accent sounds like. Yeah. Um, but he's in this, like, claw tooth, claw, claw tooth, claw. Yeah. What's it called? Is it claw tooth? Toad? Maybe. Claw toad? Claw footed? I don't know. Footed. It's an old school bathtub. It's a bathtub. It has, like, claw feet. He's taking a bath and um, he's playing Among Us with some of the, like the world's like most prolific detectives. I'm, I'm doing quote detectives, but one of those people that he's doing that with is Angela Lansbury. So Jessica Fletcher from Murder She Wrote. Murder, he's she playing. Wrote. It is such an awesome and lovely deep cut. And to know that Angela Lansbury, we just lost her not too long ago, a few months ago, like this, this will be probably her last on screen depiction. And it's her returning to her Angela Fletcher, um, or her, uh, Jessica Fletcher, uh, murder. She wrote days. I grew up watching murder. She wrote, she was, I mean, she was a, a staple in our household. And so for that scene alone, I fell in love with this movie just for Ryan Johnson, thinking on that level and bringing these people in it was such a wonderful cameo and and so it was moving and it was super funny odd trivia off of that it was not only angela lansbury's final posthumous role but it was also steven sondheim's final posthumous role really yes two people um two like iconic people yeah exactly um so the the Looking at the whole thing as as a whole, the script as a whole, the cast as a whole, the the you know the the way it was portrayed as a whole, it all makes so much sense. But I still found it a bit unsatisfying. But I think that's kind yeah. of the point of it is that it is unsatisfying, and that you think there's going to be more there, and there's just not. And I will say, I, my biggest critique is exactly what you said. There are still just too many pieces of the movie that they just went back and re-showed us partly literally. I mean, they kind of literally quite play literally, yeah. half the movie again, yes. but also in like, you know, he does that big speech about, or, or I'm sorry, she does that big speech about the idea of people that actually want to like, you know, reject authority and destroy the establishment and what that really looks like. Yeah. And we see that kind of portrayed in a way uh, later in the film but then they make it a point to really spell out that she's doing it. And I, I don't know. Again, it's just kind of it, overly spelled out for yeah, us when it could yeah. have been a bit more subtle. And there's a lot of places that the subtlety has impact. And then when you spell it out, it becomes a bit more eye roll. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that, that's how I felt. We, I think we probably saw 30% of this film in duplicate. Um, that's what it felt we saw like. it from a different person's perspective and and it works really well in things like back to the future 2 where you're seeing some scenes from a different angle um from the first film from a different angle you know when marty mcfly goes back back and does all that stuff um but it's used it's used much more sparingly and it's used as uh, an enhancer in this film they used it as a mechanism and that mechanism 
they overplayed it. Like it just was, it was too much. If there was a handful of them, like that would have been okay. But like, we literally saw about 30% of this film again, hearing the same dialogue, hearing the same exchanges just from like this angle versus this angle. And I know that it's telling a different picture, but we already understand by that point, they've already announced that this is her twin and that she's on this Island because, um, and she's working in cahoots with, with, with Blanc and all these things. Like we already know all of that stuff. We don't need, like a lot of the stuff can just be inferred that she got this knowledge because she was sneaking around. You don't have to show her actually sneaking around to show all of this stuff. You don't have to retell us the kombucha has alcohol in it. Right. You yeah. don't have to, like, you don't have to re-show us about who, who set down the drink and how it got switched. You don't have to like try to implant fake memories in us. You don't like all of that stuff. That could have all been done away with. It would have been fine. Absolutely. I the, I think a way that it could have enhanced it, there's uh, um, Duke, right? Duke Cody is uh, is Dave Batista's character. And he has this gun that he just carries around with him and he fires it off and does all these things. And it would have been cool if when he fires that gun, that actually triggered something and we see the effect of that. But we don't see yeah. that. We just see him firing off the gun from someone else's perspective. And it would have been cool like if he had fired off the gun and then you saw a bird drop like next to them or like uh, something that would imply more storytelling, but instead it was just rehashed storytelling. And that sure. was that was I think the biggest detriment to this movie. But um man, yeah. It, I mean it was fun. It was fun. Yeah, ultimately uh not as good as the first one. Still very good and I still am ready to see whatever happens next. You knew what was going to happen. I'm asking. I I'm I'm stating this as if it was obvious to everybody. I knew the second that that we knew that that was like the fail safe fire thing and that his statement was that he always wanted his name to be associated with uh, spoken in the same sentence as the Mona Lisa. I instantly knew that that sentence was going to be uh Miles Braun destroys the Mona Lisa. <laughs> like I yeah. knew that that was how that was going to play out at the very end. Very end was the eye roll moment where they said, well, you always said you wanted your name to be blah, 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 blah. blah. And I'm like, come on. We knew that. Like, just we leave it. Just yes. leave it. Yeah. Uh, I will say I did find the one as much as I don't feel like this film was as beautiful as the first film. Uh, the one shot I loved was when he put on his cap and you see the police boats coming in and you're kind of like looking out over the, I think it's night at that time. Yeah. He might have like a Piper cigar or something. Yeah, I think he has a Piper cigar, yep. I That shot just immediately evoked like classic film imagery, and I loved that shot so much. Like and everything's been wrapped up nicely. Like, here we are. Uh, yeah. I loved that shot so much. Uh, wow, I could have completely done without the idea of the, well, whatever. The, so So much of the... The hot sauce gag was stupid. <laughs> I thought it was fun. I, I, not all of it. I, but I, I did think the hot sauce was the problem. Is like when you know, again, because you're being shown parts of the film twice, and so from that standpoint, you already know how it's going to resolve. That takes some of the tension away from a gag mm -hmm. like that. If you don't know what that like that's going to cause, then you are more more on the edge of your seat but when you ultimately know it doesn't do anything then what does it matter right and i wonder if this is part of the problem they explained things almost in real time they would play a scene and then within a few moments go back and replay that scene like we didn't think she was dead for very long before they showed us that she's not actually dead yeah so they they removed some of the tension from us and i think maybe that's part of the problem or maybe that's part of what is the disconnect for me because most of these movies when they do this like uh rewriting history or showing you things whatever they do it at the very end when it's like you've thought something the entire movie and you get to the end and then it's like but it wasn't really like that oh yeah. this is like you think something for a little bit and then they tell you no nah, that's not really true yeah no nah, that's not really true so, so like, they, keep, um, they keep writing and then rewriting as the movie goes you know, obviously it was integral to the plot, but the actual, um, um, the clear that is the kind of substance that's been developed, mm -hmm. I would really love to have seen this movie done without any of that, <laughs> which, which is a weird thing to say, but mm -hmm. the, all of the, um, the implications of it, 
And again, it's this kind of fake thing that doesn't actually exist uh, in the world, and it ends up having very serious uh, implications in terms of the plot itself. And um, I, I, I just would have loved if that mechanism didn't exist. At all. It was a little sci-fi. It was a little bit yeah. sci-fi trope. Like um, we have this thing that that can say that can build all these things and can help us, you know, um, propagate life on the moon but it's at some expense, like whatever that expense is. It felt very much kind of like that traditional sci-fi and trope. Yeah. Um, and I understand that, you know, it's the only reason like ultimately his, the mansion was destroyed. Yes. But I feel like there had to be another way to destroy the mansion that didn't yeah. have to Maybe just someone had that. the grill left on. <laughs> or something. Like, I don't know. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, still enjoyed the film and I still think it's a really, really good film. And I think once all of the meaning of it like clicked, then I went, ah, okay, it's better than I gave it credit for. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I think that's fair. That's that's a that's but a almost fair begrudgingly. <laughs> mm-hmm. I will be watching it again though. Yeah, so. so will I. All right, that's it, everybody. See you later.